I'm Tony Dyer, I'm a flight test engineer by trade and have been for 30 years. And I'm a lifelong mad aviation enthusiast. The aviation bug probably first bit me when I was a youngster and uh, my parents were met during their time in the Air Force and uh, also my grandfather was a, a wartime pilot and flew Catalinas, sank a U-boat and did other bits and pieces. When I was a child I suddenly wanted to know what the pilot had to do, how he would fly and uh, what it was like. You know, you go in your father's car and there would be a steering wheel and I just wanted to know what it was like inside cockpits and then basically I started thinking well maybe I should build my own or re rebuild my own. So I started rebuilding them so I could bring them and to other people who would have the same interests. My name is Elizabeth Ball but everybody knows me as Bunty. I've been chair seating and basket making for over 30 years. Today we're at Martlesham Heath Control Tower which is also a museum which is one of the buildings left from the original RAF station which opened here in 1917 to 1963. My personal connection with this is that I was born at uh, Cranwell RAF station and my father was stationed here from 1924 to 1930. This was a huge experimental station and now is covered by a large housing estate. Well, the Sopwith Camel was built by the Sopwith Aviation Company and it was launched in 1916. My grandfather, who was a pilot in the war, as a little boy growing up in Felixstowe, he had a sailing boat and he went to a surplus store and when he was very young, probably about eight years old, and he bought a Sopwith Camel compass for his sailing boat that he would then sail on the sea. And it just seemed nice to build a project around that. And Sopwith Camel, quite honestly, is again a, an amazing aircraft that did an awful lot. It was the most successful Royal Flying Corps aircraft of the First World War. In its peak, on average, it shot down 76 aircraft per month in the time it was in service, which will never be paralleled, really. It's quite an, an amazing record. It was, if you like, the equivalent of the Spitfire, but from the First World War. It was actually a very difficult plane to fly. During the training, they lost quite a few airmen because of this, uh, the difficulty. Amazingly, the fuel tank is behind the pilot's seat. 75% of its weight was concentrated in the first seven and a half feet of the aircraft, which is an awful lot. So it's quite twitchy. It also had, a ro it had what was called a rotary engine, which meant the whole engine rotated. So the whole engine was joined to the propeller and rotated, which gave gyroscopic effects to the aircraft, which made it quite a handful. But once people learnt to fly the aircraft and knew its nuances and all its funny little characteristics, it really was a world beater. Here is a model of the Sopwith Camel. So you can see that a lot of the weight is based at the front of the aircraft. So you can see here, this is the propeller, which was joined to the engine and the whole engine rotated. Very prominent are the two guns here. And you can just see through there, you can see the humpback, which gave the Camel its name. The amazing thing about the Sopwith Camel and all aircraft at that time was they had to be really light. You take the full up weight of a Sopwith Camel is about 650 kilograms. That's a really light amount. You know, I weigh about 100 kilograms. So everything had to be light. The engine wasn't particularly powerful. So they would use a lot of materials that would be as light as possible. They didn't have the materials we have nowadays, but they had great materials that were light. For instance, the seat. Basket seats were used in aircraft because they were lightweight. Originally, they had been wood or metal, but because of the construction of the aircraft, they needed to be very light in weight, and that's why they used basket work. I needed a seat for the camel, and I wanted it to be as real as possible and as authentic. Um, I'm not capable of doing that sort of thing, uh, but I was put in touch with Tim Palmer, who made a superb job and made a very good seat. My name is Tim Palmer. I'm a retired, or now retired, consultant pathologist in the health service, and I've making, been making baskets seriously 
for the last 23, 24 years, but I actually made my first basket at the age of 10 when I was at, at school. I got an email out of the blue from the Montrose Air Station Heritage Centre asking if I would be willing to make some seats for a replica, replica BE-2A aircraft that they were making. Now, the Montrose Air Station was one of the very early Royal Flying Corps air stations, and Number 2 Squadron, which was based there, was the first squadron to land planes in France, having come from the UK. And Number 2 Squadron is currently based at Lossiemouth, just along the Murray, Murray coast. So another, another set of connections there, but making the BE-2A seat, I've never done anything like that before, but hey, I'm up for a challenge. So I said yes, and I was sent some pictures of somebody making one in Australia and the blueprint, and I had to go from there. Uh, so it was really quite a challenge. What techniques were involved? Well, the frame, is one inch thick rattan cane that has to be bent. The shape is really quite complex. The seat base is easy enough, it's a D-shaped structure, but the back is bent in three, in three dimensions. So that's really quite a complex jig to make. And, well, I've not made jigs before, but with the plans and a bit of thought, I've come up with a jig that I can use to make seats of varying sizes. The same plan, but varying back heights. Uh, and that, I found that really interesting as an interesting engineering and design challenge. It helps that I've done quite a lot of woodworking in the past, but even so, this was something, in the words of Monty Python's, completely different, and that's always good to do. Having made the seats for the BE-2A reconstruction, I put an article about that in the BA newsletter, and as a result of which Hilary Burns sent me an email saying, I've got a commission which I can't do because I'm too busy, lucky her, would you take it on? And the commission was from Tony Dyer to build him a seat for his Sopwith Camel cockpit section replica. So the Sopwith Camel seat, slightly different, it's actually a more interesting seat to make. So I said yes, why not? And I made him Tony's one and sent it down to him. The information says it was wicker or cane. Now, I've only ever come across cane, and I've seen quite a few original seats now, and uh, they're nearly all, well, they are all made of cane work. The weave is mostly there woven, which is fully woven, but some of them have an open weave about three and a half inches of fitching. And I think for the camel seat, that is one of the ones that has uh, open, open work fitching. And some of the seats also have these handle holes at the sides. By 1916, the Royal Flying Corps were in, uh, using a particular standard, which was the Aircraft Supplies Company 264 standard. And most of the seats were made to that standard. But I have seen some other designs, but that was a pretty regular design of the time. I think they were about six shillings and threepence in the money of the 1918 period uh, to make a seat. Because of the number of aircraft, there must have been a lot of basket makers used to make these seats. Definitely, I have information from the Dryad Company of Leicester, but I also came across information of an Edward Bowser, who lives in Leeds, or lived in Leeds at the time, uh, who was advertising in the aeroplane magazine as making aircraft seats. But that's the only definite uh, information I have come across of makers. So here is the seat that Tim made for me and has come all the way from Inverness. And as you can see, it's an absolute work of art. The next stage will be to make a pad for it and also to make the sausage of leather padding here. These seats never had seat belts and they had no armour plating or anything whatsoever so they must have been quite scary to actually fly this aircraft. So now this seat will go into the Sopwith Camel project 
which will be finished hopefully in the next couple of years and go to various shows, particularly the shows to do with the 100th anniversary of the formation of the Royal Air Force.